Uh, so th this is uh, what we call the, the micro Zoom care and share. So this is planned by the Department of General Safety and Health Wellness team. Uh, so normally, as you know, uh, we plan a lot of events for the uh, kind of general health and wellness of the faculty, uh, the staff, and the students in the department. And so some of you kind of have been to some of our events in the past years, uh, some of which are, are like, say, the, the step challenge. So that's it's more of like a, a activity for your health. And then uh, we had that CSI uh, museum activity not so long ago, and that's kind of like the stimulate your, your mind and also this good walk to the museum. Um, so I, 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 I kind of know that at least for some of us, uh, you know, when they announce that extra month of circuit breaker is, is a bit demoralizing. Um, you can kind of see it in, in some of the, the, the chat rooms on WhatsApp and, and various apps that uh, the, the, the talking kind of died down a little bit after they made that announcement. At least that was my observation. So it seemed like people are a little bit, um, kind of got the air taken out of their tires a bit, like a little bit demoralized. Uh, so today's kind of share and care um, is to kind of reach out to the members of the department and maybe give you a little boost uh, in, in morale um, or maybe refresh your, your spirit a little bit and kind of help you through this uh, the last couple of weeks of the circuit, hopefully the last couple of weeks of the circuit. Uh, and uh, firstly, thank you, uh, John and team, for inviting me to, to share my new hobby uh, to the department. Um, at first glance, it may seem some like something uh, unrelated to, to our work, but actually, uh, alcohol and microbiology are intimately related. So I'm still doing work while I'm enjoying my cocktails. Okay, so today I'm just gonna um, make two cocktails for you to see. Uh, Two of the many cocktails I've enjoyed uh, over numerous occasions during the, the circuit breaker. Um, and the first cocktail I'm gonna make for you guys is quite old fashioned. Uh, this is something that I'm sure uh, John and, and Nick and many others are familiar with. One of the oldest cocktails, uh, um, it was first introduced in the 1800s and it's a very simple uh, whiskey based uh, cocktail. So if you don't mind, uh, I'm gonna make this in like three minutes and take you through the interesting process of making a cocktail. So this cocktail involves a uh, sugar cube, which you will put in a glass. Right? This reminds me of our microbiology uh, cocktail. And what you do is you add this interesting um, um, supplement called bitters. Okay, and there are many types of bitters. This is a famous one called Angostura bitters. Okay, I'm going to add uh, three dashes of this into the onto the um, sugar cube. Right. So you can, oops, yeah, can you see? Yeah, so you can see the bitters. And what uh, some bartenders recommend is a dash of soda water to uh, dilute it a bit, right? And then you use an interesting uh, contraption uh, that's a standard bar tool called a muddler, okay? So you, you, you muddle it, that means you, you, you um, mix up the, the sugar with the soda, water and bitters into some kind of a syrupy mix. Okay, in the muddler here. Oh, I wish you could smell this, it's so nice. Uh, and then you would gently put a large cube of ice into your glass. You use a bar spoon to manage the ice so that it doesn't crack your glass. And into that glass, you can pour uh, two ounces of bourbon. Bourbon is American whiskey, okay, uh, distilled from corn. Right, so this is uh, Jim, Jim Beam, you may have heard of this brand. White label is the uh, entry level one, you know, because for cocktails you don't want to waste money on expensive uh, whiskies. So two ounces, I'm going to add a bit more because I love alcohol. Okay. And my ice is melting. So after you add this uh, bourbon, right, you take a bar spoon and you stir it 
for about 10 to 20 seconds. Can you see the beautiful color? Can you see the color? Not if you can see. Yes. Oh my goodness. I wish you could smell this. Okay. And, and some um, bartenders recommend putting a, a candy cherry on top. These are, I think, first um, produced in, I guess, Italy, Mar maraschino cherries. You can put this into your drink to add some uh, flavor and sweetness to it. Okay. So this is your old fashioned. Uh, do you mind? I'm going to try it. Yeah, please do. Oh my goodness. That is good. Guys, I seldom drink at 3.30, but this is good. <laughs> mm. uh, I'll make for you guys okay, when this is over. Um, so, can I make one more for the ladies? Do we have time? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to make a, a pink lady for the ladies, but I'm going to drink it, okay? The pink lady is a ladies cocktail. Uh, very easy to make and it has a beautiful uh, pink color. So the first thing you do for Pink Lady, you add gin. It's a gin-based cocktail. You add uh, one ounce of one ounce of gin, which is thirty mils, into your shaker. Now the shaker I'm using is a standard shaker called a cobbler shaker. Uh, the cobbler shaker is good for beginners because it doesn't spill so easily. And that's why I'm using it. The Boston Shaker is more for professional bartenders. Uh, and I, I have it, but I, the first time I tried it, I dirtied my, my floor. I got my family quite angry, so I reverted back to Cobbler Shaker. The next thing you add is uh, grenadine, which is a colored uh, pomegranate based syrup. To give it a nice color. Half an ounce of grenadine. And you'd be surprised that you can actually add cream and milk uh, into your cocktail. So this is a half cream, uh, whipping cream and half fresh milk. I prepared this ahead of time because I didn't want to take the chance of something going wrong. So I'm going to pour the cream inside. So two ounces, one ounce cream, one ounce milk. And then I'm going to add ice and shake. Right? So don't mind, I'm going to shake this for 20 seconds. See that beautiful uh, bandung color? Oh my goodness. Isn't that gorgeous? your pink lady and garnishing is very important to me so I thought it would be fun if we had marshmallow and cherry for garnishing so we're gonna put it like that over the drink whoa there you have it oops <laughs> I'm gonna eat it anyway so this is your pink lady uh, let, do you mind if I try it yes try oh my goodness this is gorgeous Oh, so good. I'll make for the ladies and for the men if you want it, okay, when this is over. Lovely. So uh, that's all I have. This is uh, uh, two of the many cocktails I've been uh, enjoying uh, every evening. Um, I, I uh, restrict myself to one or two cocktails uh, to keep my health uh, uh, intact. Um, but it's a wonderful thing to do because uh, the circuit breaker is a chance for us to learn new skills. And I got something related to microbiology, but something alcoholic as well. Right, so thank you very much. Over to you, John. Even for us during the circuit breaker, where our movements are heavily restricted. Here 
are three tips on how you can spend your time productively. What good time now than ever to spring clean your house? This is one opportunity where you can plan to clean your windows, change your curtains and show care to the things that you own. And many a times we find ourselves having clothes and items that we no longer need or find joy in possessing. These items will only take up space in your wardrobe. One simple way is to have a declutter box which serves as a donation box. You can actively grab items on a weekly basis and when it gets full, you make your way to the Salvation Army or to the charity of your choice. A wise man once said that two blessings which many people forget the value of until they are lost are health and free time for doing good. One easy tip to make use of your time beneficially even at your laziest moments is to read. Any kind of quality reading such as reading motivational books, reading the news or research papers are good. But even reading a blog or an Instagram post can be a worthwhile read when it is constructive. So, the next time you swipe a post, take the time to reflect one lesson you can benefit from it. We can all learn to make a healthy meal while we are stuck at home. A healthy body yields a healthy mind and soul. There are many recipes to learn from, like blogs, YouTube channels, and you can learn by trial and error. For me, I like to start simple. I like making smoothies once in a while, playing with a different combination of fruits and adding nuts and spices like turmeric and cocoa to my smoothies. Smoothie not only provides us with nutrients for our body, which is what we need to care most right now, but also keeps us away from binging those unhealthy snacks. But no matter what fruit combination you use, they always taste so good and refreshing. It has been a while since we were confined in our homes and it will probably be a while more. While we cannot change the situation we are in right now, nevertheless, it is important for us to think positive. Thinking positive will lead us to be more productive, energetic and makes us realise and appreciate what we have and have been blessed with. I'm going to end this video with this. Think positive, count your blessings and it is never too late to start something good. Goodbye. Now we have a more intellectual uh, discussion um, uh, Luigi Noir. Okay. Um, I, I was put on this. There was some miscommunications, and but I thought I would take, take advantage of this miscommunication with LC. And I mentioned to LC that and um, during the circuit breaker, maybe there's a good time to practice uh, calligraphy. But she thought that I must be pretty good in calligraphy. So um, he, you know, she asked me to, to give this presentation. Um, okay, I will start with the first slide. One of the best, well it's not the one of the best, the best calligraphy in the Chinese history. I'll give some details. This one here. So, so that's the details. It was written by what you call the sage of a calligraphy in China's um, in that's the Jin Tang Dynasty, which is um, and the the, the time was uh, 301 361 AD, and um, that is on one of the festival. It's called the um, Spring Purification Festival on the third day of the third lunar year on the, th uh, the year of um, 353 AD. And well, that's his, his portrait. Um, so this may not be the, or this is not the original. It's the best copy what I think this best copy is made, uh, it's been made, it was copied by a person called Feng Chongsu, that's in the Tang Dynasty, uh, 618, 617 or 672 uh, AD. And that is just, just for the time when the Tang Dynasty started uh, with um, this person, Tang Taizong, that's the, the second emperor 
of NSD. And um, why do you think this is the closest to the real one? Because that overlaps with um, once you use the seventh sum, which has been at that time, um, it was uh, this Tang Tai Zong took over uh, of this original. And this is uh, the fourth emperor of the Tang Dynasty. So there's a seal. I cannot tell which one is his royal seal. His royal seal is on, on, on this. So that means this was very, very early. It's about the same time um, around when the time when the, when the emperor actually got a hold of this, um, uh, this uh, uh, what is a copy, the closest to copy. Um, so I hope I haven't wasted your time. Um, let me come back to the camera. Um, so what I did was, um, I didn't write too much. Um, what it is, um, last time when I went back, my friend says he practiced a lot. He got me a kit. So he got me two versions of this, uh, what called the and you can actually practice inside how to do the strokes. strokes. He said you choose one of them, either that's called Ouyang, and the other one is um, uh, Yan Ping Qing. And uh, I like one of them more than the other one. So you need to have a brush, that's the brush that I have. And then what you do is um, you don't know how to hold, hold the brush. Usually is you need to uh, suspend your the, the, the disc here and you write almost like a, a vertical. And of course you need to have a ink. You need to have something. I don't have a, a stone. I have this. Uh, it, it works perfectly well. And uh, most importantly, you need to have some of the paper. And when this opens, if you want some paper, I can get some for you. That's this uh, one. It is quite, uh, it's not very smooth. If it's smooth, the, the ink will start to flow. And this one will absorb very quickly. So you write on the square, you know the proportion of the characters. And um, you need to have two weight and to put on the side so that the paper doesn't move. If you write too, take some time, when the ink starts to dry, the paper starts to get a bit wrinkled. But this one actually helped to make it flat. And um, I think that's about all I have. But, but just like, you need a lot of patience to, to do. I mean, just write one. I just want to show you one, the earlier one. You know, you have to write this. Um, I think for people who know Chinese, this is called a warrior. It's a brief, uh, as the, if you use it as a verb, it's like a brief, uh, the, the adverb. Otherwise, it's called the warrior. I should read all this at the end, it's easier. It's a warrior. Um, so, and if, after you write for a while, you start to realize, does it look like a warrior? And uh, so, I start to think about that three parts. So, I start to feel like that's the head. This is the six packs over here. Warrior need to have a lot of muscles, right? <laughs> and then these are the legs. You need to be the, the legs need to be really, really flexible and strong, right? So actually, this is the, the strength. So you start after you're writing a few pages, you start realize, okay, where do I find the spirit of the warrior from the from the character? And this is true for the Chinese character. And um, it is a sign language. When you write it, actually you have to feel it. And I, I really, my technique is very, very basic. But after you write this many times, you start to feel that this capture is actually something is 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 quite quite active. So which one's good, which one's not good, and you start to circle maybe on the whole page. This one looks uh, you like, and um, there's another half page here. It's not always 
reproducible, uh, but it's something stuck in the, the back. Um, so it's it just like you need to um, forget about anything else. You cannot think about think about anything. You still think about experiment. Your strokes are going to go away. So it has to be really quiet to feel, and to but still you need to learn the basics, the strokes. Uh, that's still very important. Uh, I think that's that's all I'm going to share. Okay, moving on. Uh, now we have uh, gemstone appreciation from uh, Pencil. So, Oker. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's get started. So, I want to start this uh, talk uh, with something uh, maybe not m many people are aware of. And this is um, the co-evolution of life and minerals on Earth. So all what's what we see around us, ourselves, we are all made of stardust. And um, it is assumed that there have been only <clears throat> about a few dozens of pre-stellar minerals when our sun system was forming. This is a third generation sun system. And um, then it's also quite well known. So, so when the Earth was starting to form, of course, there were some tectonic movements, volcanism, and this has diversified the uh, number of minerals on the planet in the absence of life um, to a number of about 1500 minerals in the pre-life um, uh, area, abi abiotic era. And then it's, it's well known that uh, certain minerals participated and facilitated the evolution of life on Earth. Yes, yeah? so certain clays and metal sulfide surfaces, and then the biomolecules molecules were starting to exist and the life came into place and the life started to diversify and it um, has been well reported and this was about um, roughly um, I want to minimize this one okay um, 3.8 uh, billion years ago there was a kind of a bio boost and um, what is rather unknown is that with the evolution of life um, life has certain features so it, it enables the separation and concentration of elements and uh, it generates far from equilibrium conditions and of course there was a major um, oxidation event when the plants were evolving and this has started to further diversify the number of minerals on earth and um, so now my I cannot move my slides anymore is a problem here. It's not moving. Okay, now it's coming now. Okay, so nowadays we have about 5,100 minerals on Earth and most of them are only on our planet because there is life on the planet. And um, an example of the concentration of elements is given here by some of these um, sea bluebell uh, tunicates which concentrate vanadium over 10 million fold uh, compared to the seawater level. And uh, it's believed that the um, unique color of the um, emeralds found in Colombia are colored by, found in sediments of the former sea. Um, this, that this kind of uh, organisms have contributed to the um, trace elements triggering this color. And uh, maybe an impressive example that really there was a co-evolution is just looking at this um, petroleum quartz crystals which can be found in Pakistan, which include uh, liquid petroleum, butan gas and uh, carbon. Um, of course, the, the petroleum originates from, from bacteria which were around earlier. And uh, it's also not unexpected that the oldest gemstones on Earth are of extraterrestrial origin. These are palisite peridots. Uh, as shown here, this is an iron meteorite full with crystals of uh, extraterrestrial peri peridot. And this can be faceted to form a gemstone rather expensive, I have to say. The same mineral which originated from Earth, of course, is about 1,000 fold uh, cheaper. Looking at the origins of gemstones, I highlighted four destinations. I mean, the most interesting is certainly Myanmar. And then we have some hotspots in East Africa, Madagascar, Sri Lanka. And uh, the interesting part is um, if we look, uh, I mean, these minerals, they obviously um, were and gemstones, they were created before the continental drift started. And uh, it means if we go back to the to the time about 180 million years ago, there was only a single continent here, which was Pangaea. And on Pangaea, if we have a closer look, all these uh, hotspots here, East Africa, Madagascar, South India, um, and Sri Lanka, they have been uh, spotted together. So basically, this is a single 
spot, which was then breaking in, into parts with the uh, um, with the continental shift. And this part also tells us there's another continent here, Antarctica, which is part of this hotspot. So we can expect uh, that there will be um, many more uh, gemstones uh, be able to be mined from Antarctica, which has not been uh, explored yet. So what is a gemstone? The classical definition is it must be something beautiful, rare and durable. And whatever is uh, durable, more durable, more hard on the most hardness scale than quartz, which is around everywhere, is, can be considered a gemstone. Whatever is below in hardness, so, so being beautiful and rare, is considered semi-precious. And uh, nowadays, these uh, separations are not that strict anymore. And we have other classifications, including collector stones and rare gemstones. But uh, from these 5,500 millimeters which have been found and described on Earth so far, about 200 varieties are used for as gemstones. Um, I guess I skip this slide due to, due to the limited time. Let's talk about the famous five. Everybody knows these five uh, gemstones, diamonds, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and jade. And uh, they all consider to be uh, the most expensive and rare gemstones on Earth, but it's rather the, um, this is absolutely not the case if you look at the production numbers here in millions of carats for diamonds, for rubies, and uh, of course the largest um, supply is indeed uh, jade. So um, with respect to this, they cannot be, con this is not a rare material. Yeah? This is absolutely not rare. They are highly abundant and you can basically purchase these stones in every jewelry shop on the, on the planet. And if we look at jade, uh, it's even softer than quartz with a hardness of 6.5 to 7. So it would, according to the de definition, not even be um, considered to be a precious stone. And you see here there are rocks um, of, um, of um, um, jade found in, in Burma, which, which weigh uh, tens of tons up to hundreds of tons. So it's, it's absolutely not a, a rare thing. So all these are highly abundant. And uh, another thing is that all of those, 98% uh, of rubies, sapphires, and emeralds, including the fancy color diamonds, they are treated yeah, with different kinds of treatment, heat, um, radiation, and jade is frequently um, um, filled with, uh, with polymers, with plastic. So I want to um, yeah, um, introduce to you um, some of the, or these are indeed the rarest um, gemstones which are existing on Earth. And um, if you compare the abundance, they are about a million to billion fold rarer than, than diamonds. And uh, if you look here at the top three of the list, uh, John Koi, Kuvalet, Kuvalet, and the Bromelite, there has been only a single specimen found on Earth so far. And in this case, it was only 1.6 carat. Yeah, this is a stone here, highly interesting, showing a pleochorism depending on the light source, polarized light or normal light. And the ankle, you watch the stone, it shows a different color. Um, Bromelite is interesting because it's as hard as um, a sapphire with a hardness of nine. But um, be, um, except for the first three, um, basically I have almost all of them in, in my collection. And the stones you see here are stones which I have in my collection. Very interesting is muscovite, uh, which is um, found in Myanmar, Tanzania and Sri Lanka, forming um, uh, beautiful uh, crystals. And uh, here I have a very rare red muscovite, indeed the only one um, I'm aware of. I have never seen an, another red one. Then you can also see that many of these stones like Hibonite, Putridite, Yoachidolite, some of them have been found very recently only. So, so they are I mean, described for the first time in 2009 or in, uh, close to 20 years ago. And mainly coming from Myanmar. Yeah, But many of them are quite beautiful. Putridite is a very, uh, is this pink material here. And Pinite, this was uh, the um, described to be the rarest gemstone on Earth in the Guinness Book of World Records in 2005, uh, reported for the first time in uh, 57, is this material here. And um, interesting uh, red deep color. Two of the stones here, Big Spite and Benitoite, they are found uh, exclusively in, uh, in the USA, in Utah or in California, here forming these red and blue crystals here. And uh, if we, if, we, if we look at the, the rarity, to get a, a clean stone of, of any of them in the size, the size of a single carat is, easy, is, is more difficult than to find a, a clean a 50 carat diamond. And the list is being continued here with minerals listed here, like uh, 
Jeremy White, uh, Tafeet, and so on. These are all um, beautiful stones, um, much rarer than diamonds, and uh, it's worth to uh, to um, yeah to consider them when you think about designing your own jewelry. And because many of them are found nearby, I mean, it's not too far away, Myanmar or Vietnam. Interesting, uh, this kind of spinel. Spinel per se is not um, a very rare material. It's it's abundant as rubies, but some spinels like this uh, cobalt blue spinel here on the right side um, is, high, is, is, is extremely rare. And there is uh, basically only once a year they find a gemstone of, a, of one carat or more at all, yeah, of this kind of uh, material. Interesting also color change uh, spinels, which uh, exclusively come in this quality from Myanmar, from, from Vietnam, and the so-called uh, Jedi spinels, which show this um, electric uh, um, red uh, color, which uh, kind of, um, yeah, fluorescent you. So, um, Sometimes we want to know, uh, yeah, where, what is the reference source for stones? And uh, to, to, sometimes we want to know whether a, a stone is certainly is, is significant or has a particular large size. Then it's, it's good to look at the Guinness Book of World Records. We, we can see what is present in museum collections like the Smithsonian Institution in Washington or the Museum of Natural History in London. We can read the reports about um, from the Gemological Institute of America and other research publications. And according to all this, uh, considering all these references, um, it's, it's uh, rather likely that these stones here, in, in which I'm happy to have in my collection, uh, are among the, the world's largest in existence. So these are some, this large anthotite here, a petalite, a polukite, and a uh, jeremiahite and silimanite. Um, some of them from Myanmar, others from, um, from India. This is from India. So, it was uh, even for me, I mean, I started collecting very early with three years, but um, with this focus on, on the uh, Asian stones uh, rather shortly and um, just uh, three or four years ago. And I could, uh, I was lucky to get all these stones. I just want to briefly guide you through some interesting effect, optical effects you can find in gemstones. Um, uh, you get uh, this um, asterism, which means some stones when they formed uh, or polished into cabochons, they show uh, a star effect, garnet, uh, ruby with six rays or 12 rays. Some stones um, show chatoyons and um, or cat's eye effect. And if you go to the jewelries here, um, they usually just um, consider this stone to be a cat's eye. So without uh, basically knowing what is the mineral behind, because cat's eye is an effect uh, which is shown in uh, or found in many different gemstones, but they typically use this expression uh, when they mean a chrysoberyl. Other interesting effects are iridescence found in opals, and then there has been recently a, a, a new quality of hyalite been found, uh, which shows an extremely uh, fluorescence even in the sunlight. Uh, Adularescence found in moonstone and uh, aventurescence, which, in, which goes back to some uh, copper uh, inclusions in uh, sandstone from Oregon, is also interesting, and uh, some more effects. Interesting also is the color change effect. So it means uh, the most popular stone is certainly um, um, color change chrysoberyl, which is called Alexandrite. And it shows that these stones show different color depending on the light source. So you move from outdoor to indoor, the color of the stone changes. Yeah, in this case, from green to red. And uh, very interesting are these colors in between. When you have mixed light conditions, you have these mystic colors. There's the same for color change diaspora which is found only in Turkey. Some sapphires show this color change effect. And many garnets, which are quite interesting and different color changes, as well as the uh, unique cobalt spinel found in uh, Lukien in Northern Vietnam. <clears throat> Another interesting effect very recently reported only in the literature is the so-called Usambara effect found in chrome tourmaline. And uh, here it depends on the length of the light which is passing through the stone, which kind of color you see. So if the uh, uh, pass uh, through the stone is rather short, you see a green color. When the stone gets thicker, you see a red color. And this shows this mixed green uh, um, color effect in the cut stones, which is very interesting. Cleochrism, another uh, a very attractive effect. This is a large um, serendi bite in my collection, 13 karat stone. And which, when you look through the stone, it depends on the angle, how you 
sees a stone, whether you see a yellow color, a green color, or a blue color. And maybe the most un uncommon effect is shown here. This is a Tenebrous sense, and I made a small movie here. So when you illuminate the stones, which are rather colorless at the beginning in the indoor light with UV light, the same happens when you go into the sun. The UV light portion of the sun is enough to trigger a color change in the stones. They, they change from colorless to purple. And if you now expose the same stone to a normal light source, which has no UV uh, part, then they bleach out the color, um, the color bleaches out within a few seconds. And this um, process can be repeated uh, indefinitely often. And finally, some buying, some, some guides maybe. So um, the cheapest prices you certainly get, get when you go to the miners and into the mining areas, for example, in Northern Vietnam or in Myanmar, or you purchase the stones in the country of origin. Um, then interesting uh, gemstone gemstone hubs like in Bangkok, the uh, Jewelry Trade Center, Chantaburi, where most of the cutting and treatment industry is, and the border cities, Thai, Burmese border cities, Mesai, Mesot, where you can get uh, the cheap stones. Also attractive are the international gem fairs like Bangkok and Hong Kong. You can buy from collectors and online auctions. Here, this is a, an auction platform specifically for gemstones. The most expensive prices, of course, you get when you go to a jewelry um, retailer, for example, here in Singapore or somewhere else. But of course, buying from buying gemstones, you must always be careful. You should be knowledgeable or be accompanied by someone who is, and um, ideally be able to to do some simple tests, which tell you this stone is really what the seller tells you. I usually uh, going to the mines, the mining areas, and to the, these gemstone hubs. I I, I managed to buy all my stones to a price which is in the range of 20, 1 to 20% of the market price here in, in Singapore. To verify that the stones are real, I have this equipment here, um, portable gem tester equipment, measuring thermal conductivity, refractive index, uh, polariscope, decroscope uh, to monitor fleocroism. The Chelsea filter tells me whether the spinel has traces of cobalt. Uh, different light sources, uh, a spectroscope, a loop, and a, a pocket scale, which also enables me to um, measure the specific gravity. And uh, with the last slide here, I want to close my presentation. This shows the uh, Jewelry Trade Center, a 70-story building in the center of Bangkok, the world's um, hub, hub for uh, the gemstone industry. They also organize interesting meetings by the uh, Gemological Institute of America in Bangkok. And these are slide, uh, pictures here from my gem hunting experience in Northern Vietnam or here in uh, Sri Lanka. I also started um, cutting the stones myself. These are some of the cut stones, or I do settings here for, for some jewelry items. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. The stones I have here from Myanmar, you wouldn't even find them in the, in the museum in Yangon itself, yeah? So this is, um, it's very hard to, to, to get this kind of material. Yeah. Okay. So these are some of the stones. These are bigger size. Um, these are the two largest, presumably largest in the world. Here, this is a polokite and the uh, color change uh, petalite. Uh, another rare stone is this one here from, um, because it's colorless, the mineral itself typically occurs in different colors. And it's very rare that color is absent. Then some more tiny stuff, but um, at least as rare or even rarer are the stones here. I have mentioned uh, putretite, which is this one here, this pink stone or hibonite from Myanmar. I never have seen larger specimen than these two here. I was lucky to get them in Yangon itself. Yeah. And of course, some stones are significantly bigger in size, like uh, this quartz crystal here. Yeah, this comes from. Um, from uh, Cambodia, cut stones. Uh, this is all uh, topaz collection here, different colors. Uh, usually, I prefer untreated stones. The only one which is treated is a blue one here to get the blue color in topaz, which you, which is typical, which you find most of the time if, if you go to the jewelry shops. This requires heat and radiation treatment. Yeah, otherwise, um, blue color stone would be rare, and rather you see a greenish blue color than this. Right, blue, blue color. This is always the result of treatment. Yeah. 
Any, uh, um... So when did you start um, your scan collection? Oh, when I was a small kid of three years. <coughs> wow. So um, I, then it was quite, um, I was not caring too much for a couple of years, but since I'm in, in, in Asia and Singapore, close to the mining areas, um, it, I, I'm very active again. Yeah, and now I have a couple of thousand stones. Yeah. And are you going to apply for a Guinness World Record? I have uh, five candidates. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's troublesome, you know, it, it takes, a, takes some time, you have to fill up a lot of forms. And you have to document it in the presence of, you get, need to get it certified in the presence of uh, somebody who is, who is independent. It's troublesome. And maybe next time I go to Bangkok. Yeah. Because it would be so cool if I can say that my professor has a Guinness World Record. And at the same time with like publication. <laughs> Yeah, so before we start, uh, I, I, for people that don't know me, I actually like to do, to try a lot of different sport, uh, sports. So, like one of them is actually boxing. Uh, yeah, so I think it's going to start soon. Okay, and join. To do boxing, you need a couple of things. So, first thing first is a hand wrap. So, this helps to protect your hand so that you don't know, sprain your knees, you don't inject your finger when you're doing boxing. So, uh, let you know how to put it on. And then it's your glove. So, a glove, um, there's different size of glove, and the one that I'm using right now is 10 pounds. Um, before that, I was using eight pounds, and uh, it's more suitable for people with like smaller hand like me. So ten on can be quite um, heavy after a while, but you can also go for like twelve pounds if you want to. So you can actually find out how to do this from YouTube. So I'm just going to do one. Um, just put it on in your thumb. Give it like. Two wraps here, and then you can wrap around your palms. Mm. Um, palm is very important, so give it a good wrap, and then you can just like start wrapping around. So, uh, when I did boxing previously, they actually uh, don't do wrap around individual fingers, but that really depends on you if you want to do that. But for me, I'm not doing it today, so. When it's done, um, you should feel that it's supporting your knees and also your palm. But at the same time, not too tight so that you can actually move your finger free. So when you are done, uh, let me just show you a few punches um, that we usually do. So always um, weave apart, uh, hips apart, hands always on your face because when we are doing boxing, um, if you are sparring with other people, when your hand is down, people could just punch you on your face. So you want to make sure that your hand is always on your face, near your face, but not too near because otherwise people will punch you and then you just hit on someone and you just go like that. Yeah. So without wearing gloves, let me just show you a few punches. So we have the jab, cross, hook. So basically jab, you want to jab on their face, right? Or uh, right now, I'll just do uh, jabbing on the face. So imagine someone that you really hate, okay, let's like say your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. So the face is here, you are arms apart. So we do a jab on the face, a cross on the face. So try to be very agile, you are always going to move, 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 so check, 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 so the beauty about like boxing is that uh, by learning jab, cross, hook, hook, uppercut, and uppercut, 
you can actually put them together as a combo. So we could do jack pussy. In my case, I do boxing solely for fitness purpose. So if we wanted to do it for combat, uh, we can look at this video. I come up, boom, boom. I step over to get another angle. And then I can fire again if I want. My family has been very invested in fitness, so you could see that we have like yoga mat. This is my thank you, G Dum Dump. I highly recommend this from Decathlon because um, it's really um, detachable, so you can make it as um, low as 2 kg but as high as 10 kg. So we have quite a few yoga blocks. Oh, this is this is good for um, squats. Um, you put it around your thigh, and when you squat, it gives you extra. Uh, resistance. So I think I'm just short of a uh, resistance band. An app ruler. Okay. Cops. These are all my brothers and sisters. Golf stick. So many of them. So apart from boxing, there is actually a lot of alternative exercise that you can do. Uh, personally, I really like running, but running is very uh, aerobatic. So in this case, it um, if you are doing like long distance running, like me, it actually um, caused me to lose muscle. So uh, routinely, I actually build and uh, strength uh, exercise. That's why I'm, uh, I bought the 10 kg dumbbell. So um, there is a lot of home workout um, video out there on YouTube that we could just like follow them. Uh, one of them that I really recommend is uh, Jordan Yo. But if you're looking at doing a very short, explosive workout because you don't have a lot of time, I highly recommend burpees because burpees really engage the muscle of your entire body. Yeah, uh, strength tra training is very important because it helps you to build your muscle on your arm your core muscle as well as uh, your legs. So this is very important in the case of if you are interested in boxing or um, be it like um, dance, uh, it, it really requires you to use the core muscles. So uh, strength uh, training really helps. Uh, if you are looking at um, doing more of to in incorporate meditation, I highly recommend yoga. Um, Pilate helps with uh, core muscle as well. It's like a lot of exercise that I've tried before and um, yeah, there is a lot of exercise out there that um, no harm trying and you might find something that you really enjoy and uh, you might take it on for the rest of your life. So. Apart from that, exercise is not the only thing that is important for fitness. If you want to maintain fitness, um, the food that you eat is also very important. So um, personally, I cook every day. Maybe I can show you what I cook. Today is a lazy day, so I made some kimchi pancake, chive pancake as well as vegetables. But usually I go a bit more than this and um, yeah, it's just a lazy day. So that's all for today. See you around in the school. Bye-bye. Bye.